Earl Swanson, September 6, 2007. This is Studio X, Campbell Hall in Urbana, Illinois. I'm Dee Breeding, interviewing Mr. Swanson. Good morning, Mr. Swanson. It's so nice of you to spend this time, uh, inter you know, uh, recording your experiences in World War II. We are very grateful for you doing this. Could you say for the record uh, your name and a little bit about where you're from and where you live now and what you're doing now? I'm Earl Swanson. Uh, we live here in Urbana. <clears throat> As I was mentioning, we lived in the same house for 53 years now. And um, I was a professor at the University of Illinois in agricultural economics, retired in 1984. So long ago, I've forgotten what I did. <laughs> but um, I was a farm boy, and I came to the university in 1939 in the College of Agriculture. Where are you from then, before you came to school here? Uh, between Rankin and East Lynn. It's in the northern part of Vermilion County. And uh, after the war, I stayed home for a year and farmed with my father. And then the GI Bill took me to graduate school, and I started on a different path. Mm -hmm. So you were in, you were a farm boy and you lived in sort of a rural area. Then. Oh yes, uh, yes. Went to high school in East, East Lynn. Lynn there were only seventy five in the high school, and my class I think had seventeen. The class of nineteen thirty nine. Why did you decide to attend uh, University of Illinois? Um, my father had gone here a long time ago, nineteen eight to ten, and uh, I got a scholarship. So it was attractive, and tuition wasn't very high then. So uh, in September of 39, I arrived on campus. And you joined the ROTC right away. That's right. At, uh, mand ROTC was mandatory for uh, freshmen and sophomores. And uh, I got in the field artillery probably by chance because the other units, Signal Corps and so forth, were closed. So I became an artilleryman, not by choice, but just by chance. ROTC was, was mandatory? Yes, Is that it was required for all students, male students. And um, Because of the times? I mean, that's not... No, it, it was mandatory, of, irrespective of whether there was an emergency or not. I see. But then the last two years, my junior and senior year, those were called advanced ROTC, and they uh, uh, were not mandatory, but you had to apply for those. Mm -hmm. So um, the um, training was with, in 1939, 40, 41, the training was with old, World War I guns, the French 75. And um, we were, I was in a horse-drawn unit, and I remember we, the horse stables were where the present University of Illinois Law Building is now. And uh, we had to practice the different gates going in a circle around the, uh, where the parking lot right south of the Law Building is. And, uh, I, when I knew that I was going into the advanced, I bought a pair of boots. And unfortunately then, they shifted to motorized artillery, so I didn't need them. But um, uh, we, then we got the 105 howitzer, which was the standard for all. And that, I stayed with the 105 all the way through in the Philippines except the time I spent in the infantry. So and you had the training on that while you were in the ROTC? That's right. And we fired, we had tiny guns on top of the, uh, of the 105, and we fired little round balls in the armory so we could practice firing. And uh, then we practiced uh, some maneuvers. Uh, they called them 
RSOP, reconnaissance, selection, occupation of position. And we, I remember going along St. Mary's Road and setting up our guns there. Um, so in those days, uh, earlier on, there were uh, co officers were commissioned directly upon graduation. They had to go to summer camp um, between their junior and senior years, and then they were commissioned when they graduated. But uh, when the war started, um, they cut that out. And uh, after I graduated, I had to go to take basic training and then go to officer candidate school. So you were going to basic training just like any other That's right. uh, en enlistee would That's do. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, something I've forgotten. What were things like on campus at that time then, 1939? That was before the U.S. got into the war, but That's right. certainly there must have been some feeling at the time That's that right. we were likely um, to do that. At uh, Pearl Harbor Day, um, strangely enough, I was studying my military lesson, <laughs> and uh, when I got the news about Pearl Harbor, that on a Sunday, and many of us, we marched down to uh, President Willard's home, and he came out and spoke to us, and he said essentially, uh, uh, stay in school, until you're called. And, uh, but a lot of my friends didn't do that. They wanted to hurry up and sign up right away. Um, so all the students did, or just the ones that were in the ROTC marched down to? Uh, oh, they were mixture. Uh, some of them not in ROTC. And uh, they wanted to hear what Willard had to say. Um, yeah, the uh, the campus uh, reacted, I think, to the war in what one would what one would expect that um, we were somewhat uh, uh, we wanted to show our patriotism, and still uh, we wanted to continue our education. So there was a trade-off there. And you decided to stay in, too, rather than... Uh, That's right, because the chances of finishing school were much better if you got into the advanced ROTC. And uh, I remember I talked to my father about that, and he supported that decision. Um, so... Uh, I graduated on time in 1943, and uh, <clears throat> then was immediately, not immediately, in about a month, uh, called to active duty at Camp Grant, Illinois. And uh, I remember I took my, my laundry case that I used to send clothes home to my mother. I took that up to Camp Grant and sent my civilian clothes home in that, and uh, a bottle of hair oil because we didn't have any hair left. We had butch haircuts. So uh, then we were sent to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin for basic training, basic infantry training. And there I met uh, one of my neighbor friends, uh, Art Jacob, and we had some good times together. And then, uh, after basic training, went to officer candidate school in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So that friend you mentioned was one of your friends from East Lynn. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. he, he grew up, he lived across the road from us at home. His f family farmed across the road from us at home. So he decided to go into basic training, then he enlisted. He was an enlisted man, mm -hmm. that's right. Did any of your other um, 
classmates from the U of I who were, go with you? Uh, were they ever, were they assigned along with you? Oh, yes. Uh, there were probably uh, 20 of us. Uh, now, the, RO <clears throat> the ROTC class um, that left uh, Camp, uh, Camp McCoy to, to make up uh, the OCS class, I think there were about 20 University of Illinois people, and uh, I remember most of them. And the, uh, there was another group of ROTC people from Michigan State. I think roughly 50 of Michigan State and 25 Illinois, and the rest of the class, now this is at Fort Sill, but the rest of the class was uh, made up of enlisted men that were becoming officers out of the ranks. And uh, uh, so we started our class 9-0, I think in August of 43. And uh, while I was there in OCS, <clears throat> um, one of my friends, uh, Jack Richmond, who has a contribution here to WILL, uh, he was in class 81, and he was a friend of mine. We had been in agriculture together. And he had uh, some blood problems. And I remember he was in the hospital going up to see him one Sunday. And he eventually was sent home and discharged. Um, in OCS, uh, I met some, um, some of the graduates that had gotten through before I did. Uh, they told me that usually you got sent back a couple classes for demerits. We called those gigs. And uh, I got a couple demerits. I think once I, didn't, I was running or trotting and saluted an officer and you're supposed to be walking. <laughs> And uh, then I had my trousers and shirt hanging on separate hangers or something like that. It was very hard to keep the huts, the huts, there were six in a hut, clean because of the dust or the sand blowing. And uh, then once I got a gig, we were out on a firing mission and I didn't keep my sketch of the terrain up to date which was a little more serious. So um, I got through without any, any uh, setbacks and graduated in December of 43. Um, we had a couple of Yale boys that came in. One of them I remember was um, um, Alexander Montgomery the third. His father was a colonel in the army, but for some reason, this young student, Alexander III, got set back in OCS classes. And we nicknamed him Bombsite because he carried a little briefcase with him all the time. And uh, at that time, there was some discussion that the US was developing a bombsite that was superior to the Germans. And we thought, we were kidding him, of course, that we thought that he was carrying those instructions in his briefcase. <laughs> he had the plans there but, ready with him. But he, uh, he didn't stay with us long. For some reason, he got sent back again. And uh, so we lost track of him. Uh, one of my good friends in OCS was Royal Sutkus. He was from Michigan State. And he was a majoring in wildlife management. So we spent time on Sundays, especially, going up in the mountains and uh, around Fort Sill. Uh, he told me he was from the UP. And I thought that meant Union Pacific. <laughs> but he told me that's the Upper Peninsula, right. where there are a lot of Finnish people. The class. The, the class members from 
of Michigan State, many of them were in police administration at Michigan State, and they were very, very well fitted physically. They did much better on the physical exercises than, than the Illinois people. So we got through uh, OCS in December, and uh, I, I came home, and uh, I had told my parents that uh, I was pretty sure that that I was going to graduate, though, so they could send me my advanced ROTC uniform because they were officers' uniform that we had in advanced ROTC. Um, after OCS, I was assigned back to SEAL in postgraduate training or some sort. We were assigned to a replacement unit and we were told that, uh, that uh, you had to be prepared on 10 minutes notice to give instruction on any one of a list of items. And uh, I soon found out that, that junior officers did most of the work. And uh, we were in huts again, but instead of six, there were only four in a hut. And we had to furnish our own sheets and pillowcases. So uh, then I was assigned to a long tom, that's a 155 millimeter howitzer, and uh, was with them for several weeks. And I remember one long, uh, we had the, they finished their training with a 25 mile march, and it should be done in, in uh, eight hours, and start at 11 at night and end up at seven in the morning. And I think in my platoon, we had 50, and I think we lost four of them dropped out because they didn't use foot powder or for some other reason. Um, then, <clears throat> while I was in that unit at Fort Seal, uh, I was conducting fire one day at about 11 in the morning and I noticed there were a lot of brass up around the command post. And, but uh, then a, an order came down to, uh, from the general at Fort Sill to cease firing. And I thought maybe I had made a mistake. Maybe I was bombing the little town close by. <laughs> but uh, no, everything was OK. But they uh, have a new fuse that they wanted to test. So they had to substitute the ammunition. So everything was okay. I knew that something was coming up because there were too many brass, too much brass around than the normal. Okay. And when about was that again? That, that was, was in January of 44. Okay. I had gotten, uh, I finished OCS in December of 43. So then... How did you feel about the training that you got there? Oh, very good. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, in general, the Army training was much better than anything I had had at the University of Illinois, because, partly because there was no limit on the training aids that they could use. Um, and many of the, of the uh, instructors were, uh, had been in combat and were brought home or they were recuperating and that made the training much more realistic. Um, but it was good training and uh, Uh, I felt that we were uh, we were prepared, unlike something that happened later with the 106th Division. So I'm ending up my time at Fort Sill, and reporting to uh, uh, 
the 106th Division, which at that time was in, in Tennessee, but they were moving up to Atterbury, Camp Atterbury in Indiana. So you were with the um, Field Artillery Battalion then? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. The 592nd? <clears throat> That's right. In 106th uh, Division. And we went up to Atterbury, Indiana. <clears throat> and uh, it became clear that there were too many artillery officers in our, in our battery. There were only supposed to be four, and we had eight. Mm -hmm. And that meant that uh, there was a surplus, and would, they would be going, some of us would be going someplace. So I applied for a liaison pilot. These were forward observers. I had done some of that at, uh, at Atterbury. We fly and adjust fire from the, from the plane. And uh, uh, we had a little L4. There were two of us in the flight. And I remember one time flying over uh, Bloomington, Indiana, looking at the football field. <laughs> um, but I was too late. Uh, by the time my papers had gone through, I was already ordered to attend the infantry school. And this is known as retreading where we, we were changed from artillery officers to infantry officers in, uh, I believe that was about 10 week course. <clears throat> um, while I was at Atterbury, uh, as a junior officer, I got a lot of these assignments. One of them was to, there were some Italian prisoners of war there and uh, I had them out on a, on a project building a fence or something. And uh, they were given a lot of freedom. And I wanted to finish the job that same day. And, and it became four o'clock in the afternoon and they wanted to take off because they thought they had done their work duty. But I kept them on. Then another job I had was to take some troops to the port of embarkation. And we uh, had uh, old baggage cars and they had to be converted to kitchen cars. And um, so we worked day and night. I remember not getting any sleep for a couple days, trying to convert these baggage cars to kitchen cars. And uh, the port of embarkation was close to Baltimore. So uh, uh, I took, I've forgotten, around two or three hundred men out to the port of embarkation. And then I came back on my own and... Uh, so that was the 106th that was... That was the 106th. They were going to, the, to be... Yeah, but not as a unit. They were going as individual replacements. I see. And... Uh, uh, had they stayed with the 106, the 106 would have done better <laughs> than they did. Um, Why do you say that? Well, the 106 had, uh, they lost uh, over a third of their men in the Battle of the Bulge. Now, I left the 106 in, in July of 44, and they went over in September of 44. But they had a lot of young uh, ASTP, Army Special Training people, these were, uh, these were students at universities and they had not had much basic training when they came into the 106th and they didn't get much, didn't have time for much when, uh, before they went overseas. And, uh, uh, I, one of my um, professors in agricultural economics, Charles Stewart, his son was in one of those ASTP units and he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Oh. And uh, then another one of my friends, uh, Richard Moores, uh, was in the Battle of the Bulge, but he survived. Um, so I was sent, let's see, 
I was sent to the uh, Fort Benning for the infantry school. And uh, the artillery officers that were with me uh, were not particularly happy about this retreading. And I remember one of the Cornell fellows, uh, he, he paraphrased the Cornell fight song. It was, uh, instead of high above Cayuga's waters, high above the Chattahoochee on the Yupatoy stands an old abandoned outhouse, Benning School for Boys. Here I learned to chew tobacco, here I learned to drink. Hail to thee, al al alma mater, Benning how you stink. <laughs> so we would sing that song sometimes at night. So we finished our basic training, and again I met some people that um, one local fellow that I met at Benning was Paul Karlstrom. He's here in town, and he had an orchestra for a while. And uh, I met several others that um, had been with me in OCS at Seal. So then, after Benning, I... Uh, can I ask you a question? What, yeah. what was basically the difference between being in the field artillery as opposed to being in the infantry? Well, the infantry, we worked a lot with the with the rifle, the M1 rifle, and uh, uh, it was necessary as part of our training to disassemble and assemble the M1 rifle, and much more emphasis on. Uh, on the mortar, the 81 millimeter mortar, and the 60 millimeter mortar, and um, more uh, combat training, hand-to-hand -hand combat training, than with the artillery. The artillery, we were mostly involved with with uh, firing the guns and adjusting fire, and how to pick out a good position for the guns, and uh, the infantry uh, was more, there was more emphasis on uh, small arms, and uh, I was glad that I had that training in the M1 rifle, because when I got to my next assignment at the replacement training depot in Camp Blandy in Florida, uh, we were training soldiers for a, in a 20, 20 week cycle, and these were replacements, soldiers that would be sent overseas to replace people that were wounded or killed. Um, so as an officer, you needed to be trained in whatever the basic infantry were doing as well as how that, to give orders and how to That's right. Common. Okay. Um, I remember <clears throat> uh, taking the uh, the bus from. Uh, oh, it was while while I was at Fort Benning. I remember we were out on bivouac, and we heard about uh, the invasion of the Allied troops in southern France. And uh, but D-Day occurred while I was at Atterbury. What was the reaction to that like in, well, in uh, the training camps there? I think that uh, we were aware that the war was not over yet, and uh, we were fairly sure with the 106th that, that we would be going to Europe. Uh, <clears throat> I recall that going from um, A bit, Fort Benning to Camp Landing in Florida. I wrote, I took the bus, and uh, I met some farmer on the bus, and he invited me to come and see his place. And he was insulted, I think, when I told him I didn't, I couldn't make it because I had to report for duty the next day. And 
Had you told them that you were a farm boy That's right. yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I um, was well aware that there were cockroaches in the South, but I remember uh, coming into Jacksonville, Florida, uh, with a friend of mine, uh, Lieutenant Spigarelli from Utah. Um, we went to a fairly upscale hotel, and the bellboy took us up to the room, and uh, he opened the door, turned the light on, and thus the cockroaches sw were swarming everywhere. And uh, the bellboy thought that was just normal. <laughs> and, so I got on to uh, Camp Landing, and I was assigned a training unit. Uh, there were three, that's about 80 men, and there were three uh, officers, Captain Kasky, Lieutenant Metlin, and myself. And what was your rank at that time? I was second lieutenant. Second lieutenant, okay. I never got promoted until we were in the Philippines. And um, uh, this training was rather rigorous, and there was a lot of emphasis on um, working outside and doing a bivouac. Again, we had 25-mile march at the end, and I think my platoon only lost one man. And the sergeant and I had to head the column up and set the pace. Um, how long of a period of time did you actually have the men to train them to be replacements? Twenty weeks. Twenty weeks, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, we were out in a bivouac quite a lot, and I remember that you could hear the water, the water table was close, and you could hear this, the patrols walking by with your head to the ground on, in your sleeping bag. And there were king coral snakes there. And uh, I remember our sergeant getting one of them with a bayonet. <laughs> and um, at Christmas time, um, there was an order came down for promotions for the non for the uh, non commissioned officers. And uh, Lieutenant Metlin was gone, and Captain Kasky had had gone home for his father's funeral. So I had to do make the promotion list up. And I remember I talked to our first sergeant and asked him advice, but he was not he was regular army, and he thought that was very unusual for an officer to ask him for advice. <laughs> so uh, um. I did the best I could, and I think I did not quite pay attention enough to time in service, which is an old army method for looking at whether you should be promoted or not. Okay, then. So that was the Christmas of 44? Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a. Uh, I was on. Uh, of course, the officers there were, that hadn't been overseas, were uh, subject to call, too. And um, one time I found out that I had been put on a temporary hold because some unit in military government wanted an agricultural economist. And, uh, but that never went through, so I reverted back to being on available. <clears throat> so, let's see. We're back at... Uh, so you were I went home on leave a couple times. Mm -hmm. And you were spending a lot of the time when people were over in Europe fighting and you were doing the training and, and having to go through <laughs> replacement training of, of officers and everything. What Were you anxious to get over into the fighting yourself? Did you feel that way? or No, I thought just let, let the normal things roll. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And when they want me, they'll get me, they'll call me. And I didn't, didn't feel any anxiety to uh, become involved. But you were confident that what the U.S. was doing was the right thing. Oh, so. yes. And uh, I had to, one of my duties was to uh, give an orientation on the war. That is the, the um, location of where the fighting was going on, both in the West and the East. And uh, I think I had to do that once a week. So I followed what was going on. And uh, no, I guess I, uh, I didn't have any anxiety about going. I knew that eventually my time would come. And I had been actually very lucky so far being in the 106th and then leaving, being retreaded. And, um, but finally the offer, the uh, order did come through to report to Fort Ord for the Pacific Theater because we knew that in May, the E-Day, that the rest of the war was to be, take place in the Pacific. And where, where is that Fort Ord? Where is that? It's in California, okay. close to Monterey. And uh, so I reported to Fort Ord and then... Um, and that was in 1945? Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, there's, there's a school there in Monterey for local... for. Uh, military government, and I, I had a friend there, and I met him and talked to him some, Howard Haynes, and also his sister-in-law was in my graduating class <laughs> at East Lynn High School. Oh, so So I world. stopped to see her, and we went out to, to some Russian restaurant one night, I remember. But at Fort Ord, it was a long wait. I would wake up in the morning, go to the bulletin board, see if my name was on the order, and if it wasn't, then I would take off for the day. And we went down to Monterey Beach, and uh, also the 17-mile drive, we had horses, and um, the Carmel Mission. So I did a lot of sightseeing during that. It was almost a month that I was waiting at Ord for orders. And we went up to San Francisco. Uh, at that time, the United Nations was just getting started. It was 1945. And they were meeting at St. Mark's Hotel, I think. Um, In San Francisco? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a, an Armenian-American in our platoon, and we went with him one night and we got into an Armenian restaurant by going to the head of the line. <laughs> um, so the time at Fort Ord was just watching and waiting. It was May and uh, I guess I had felt some anxiety about going, but again, just take what comes. So did you feel that you had a good picture of what was happening in the war, though, during that time? Did the people in, in California and where you were know what was happening? I don't think they were completely aware of it, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they, had, they had some idea. That's right. The... Uh, Orders finally came through, and we went up to San Francisco, and uh, we were issued um, mosquito nets. So, and uh, I've forgotten we didn't start taking atabrine until we got to the Philippines. 
So what, um, you were called up then, you got your orders, and so that's when you were into the 161st Infantry Oh, that's Regiment. right. Then I joined the 25th Division. The 25th Division. That's so right. That was at Fort Orr. Fort no, Orr. no. No, that was in the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. So what were your orders exactly um, that you got when you were waiting there in California? Okay, they were to report to a replacement de depot in the Philippines. Okay. And uh, we went over on, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the ship. It was an APA, a personnel carrier. And we made two stops at Enuitak and Ulithi. And these were later the, so the sites of the testing of the atomic bombs. But uh, then we got to uh, uh, we got to the Philippines, and I remember going up past Corregidor, where the death march had taken place, and going to the dock area. And then the replacement depot was at Los Banos, Los Banos, which is right outside of Manila. <clears throat> um, This was in June of 45 then? Yes. Um, and I remember there was a Filipino coming into our tent wanting to do our laundry. And uh, he said he didn't want money, he just wanted cigarettes. And he said his wife takes it home and she scrubs it in the stream going by. So then I reported <clears throat> to uh, Cannon Company. Now, because I was an artillery officer, uh, even though Cannon Company was in the infantry, it made sense for me to be sent to that company. Now, <clears throat> what had happened was that uh, they found that in combat, uh, when the artillery was in charge of the regimental commander, the response when it was needed to support the infantry, the response was too slow. And that uh, what was needed was a, uh, the uh, artillery to be allocated to one level below that, to the battalion commanders. And uh, so th that cannon company was under the direct control of the battalion commander instead of the regimental commander, so they get a quicker response. And uh, apparently that happened. The 25th Division came in to Lingayan Gulf in January of 45. And the, uh, the battle of Manuel, San Manuel was where the uh, cannon company that I was in, uh, much later, uh, won a presidential unit citation for their action in the Battle of San Manuel. Uh, so I remember going up to my <clears throat> um, reporting to Cannon Company commander, that was Lieutenant Green. And he was a uh, Texas A&M ROTC. And um, he was, uh, prematurely gray. I think he was probably only 26 or 27. But I remember he, uh, I went into his tent and he opened up two cans of beer with his bayonet and uh, he in general said, um, just don't forget what you've learned on maneuvers and field training. So then <clears throat> I went to my platoon and I found out that, <clears throat> that I was a replacement for Clark Clemens. Now Clark Clemens had been killed about a month before, but he had been a friend of mine here in the ROTC. He was uh, in Commerce, College of Commerce, and uh, he had gone through OCS a little bit before me for some reason, I don't know why. But um, the fact that I had been a friend of, of Clark's uh, helped me 
establish rapport with the men in my platoon. And I think we had a, uh, a good working relationship, which uh, was uh, helped by my being a friend of Clark's. I'm sure that was very tough to That's right. fill in for yes. some, an officer yes. who had been killed. That's right. And the, they had been through quite a lot, uh, yeah. right, before. The Cannon Company, they had fought at, uh, but he wasn't killed in the Battle of San Manuel. He was later on the, uh, as they moved down the peninsula. Um, so, let's see. I Again, I met some... Um, some hometown boys <laughs> in, the, in the Philippines. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how I happened. Uh, the 33rd Division, which was the Illinois National Guard Division, was stationed at Baguio. Baguio is the summer capital in Luzon. And I went up there and met Leland Martin. Leland Martin had been a year ahead of me in high school. And um, he had been overseas two years, I think, and had not, never seen anybody from home. So he was glad to see me. He had been on in two battles, uh, Moratai and some other one. But he was a uh, liaison sergeant. How did you find out that he was there? Uh, I had, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that maybe, maybe my mother had written to me, telling me about the addresses of, or my maybe my sister. And then I met uh, Ray Stipp, who was in the 25th Division, and uh, I stopped and I ate supper with them. I think one night because they had steak, and <laughs> for some reason we didn't get it. So he was also a classmate from Eastland. A year younger than I was. Yeah. It must have been really something to run That's into right. an old friend like that. And, and um, then I had a letter from Ron Hatfield. He was in my class of 39. And he was on some island south. I never got to see him, but we exchanged letters. Let's see, something else I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah, when the war was over, when we got the word, <clears throat> we had um, we put twenty rounds, twenty rounds of ammunition behind each gun and fired them into the a cliff up on the side. And uh, but in one of the rifle companies, there something went wrong and one soldier was killed. And I remember we talked about, uh, it was a practice when there was a casualty that uh, the officer in charge would write a letter to the home. And uh, I remember we were talking about how to write a letter now when the war was over. So uh, let's see. Did you ever have to write such a letter no, yourself? No, I didn't. But I had to censor and this I didn't like to do, to read the outgoing mail. For the people, the in, men that were in my platoon. unit, yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to know about their personal lives, but, um, but that, that was, was a part of, of it. Responsibility. You have to, to do that. have to initial each letter going out. Mm -hmm. So, what kinds of things did you have to censor out? Everything that went out, all the letters. But I mean, what would you actually have to black out? Oh, like I never found or, anything. Oh. Yeah. They weren't supposed to tell where we were. I see. Yeah. So in the letters that you wrote home that your parents no. saved, um, you were always careful not to. That's right. What kinds of things did, did they tell you uh, ahead of time, like what not to mention in your letters? or Mostly just location. Okay. And, yeah. Or anything about your orders, I That's suppose, right. that might be considered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so let's see. Um, we've... We're through with the Philippines? Well, the Not quite. Oh, yeah, we buried a lot of ammunition. And I often wondered whether we got it deep enough. I had a picture of some Filipino farmer coming along with a plow. And 
hitting a fuse, but uh, well, and we you buried a so lot of ammunition. About, you knew so much about farming too. You That's would, right. You would have um, known how that would work. Let's see. I'm sorry, I interrupted you when you were talking about that burying the ammunition. Yeah. <clears throat> So the, the time that you, you mentioned where you shot off the rounds into the cliff, that was actually uh, when Japan surrendered then. That's, That's what you're right. referring yeah. to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, I was in combat very short period. I got, I got there, uh, uh, and we'd, we were still doing a lot of scouting because uh, individual fragments of the Japanese army were still around us. Um, Did you ever find any Japanese? Did your no, mm -hmm. no. Um, so let's see. We're getting. So then you went to Tarlac. Tarlac was the town that was close by. That was close by, where where the 161st was stationed. Um, but when we went to. Uh, Japan, we took our 105 howitzers, which were mounted on M7 tanks. We took those with us. And uh, so you you were sent. Was the whole 25th Division sent to Japan? That's after? right. That's right. And you were going there to occupy. That's Japan. right. Uh, actually, we were preparing for um, invasion of Honshu, which would have been in November. And uh, then the divisions that were coming from Europe were, were to invade, did I say Honshu? Yes. Kyushu. We were supposed to go into Kyushu, but the divisions that were coming from Europe um, we're going into Honshu sometime in, I think, in March or something, much later. But at any event, <clears throat> when the war was over, we went, became the Army of Occupation. The war, the Japanese surrendered because of the atomic bombing. That's right. Of, um, That's right. And, and uh, I guess in retrospect, uh, Harry Truman is my hero because uh, I looked at at what the prospects would have been had we had to invade, and the the coastline was very treacherous <laughs> of where we were supposed to go in. So, well, we got on this uh, AKA, which is a cargo ship, uh, USS. Tree go, <clears throat> and uh, we had our guns with us, our M7s, and uh, the Navy was not very hospitable to us. Um, the commander of our unit um, was a major, and uh, then the uh, the uh, captain of the AKA, the ship that took us to Japan. He never invited him to eat with him. And uh, the naval officers, they always ate at the first sitting and the army at the second sitting. And uh, the Navy officers, they always had ice cream with their meal. And we had to buy ours at the ship's door. <laughs> and then uh, the Navy um, it, our guns were in the hold of the 105 howitzers, and they had quadrants that we used to um, to adjust fire with. And somehow, the sailors got in and stole those quadrants. So, uh, I don't know whether you remember the play Mr. Roberts or the movie Mr. Roberts. This was it all over again because the captain said. You're going to withhold movies until you get those quadrants back. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> so they did. They came back. Um, why do you suppose they they had this uh, feeling between I don't the, know. the Army and the Navy? I don't know, but uh, uh, at any rate, we we went around uh, Okinawa. We had a typhoon at Okinawa, and we had to go in squares until we got to... We went in <clears throat> to Japan at Wakayama. Uh, Wakayama is the port city for Nagoya, and Nagoya was about 80 percent destroyed. And uh, destroyed by bombs. Okay. U.S. Not the atomic bomb. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. um, and the Japanese Navy had. Um, a naval air station close to Wakayama Koromo, and uh, and we uh, took over their quarters, and they were very nice. The best thing I had seen since Seal. <laughs> um, what? How so? How was the? Oh, they were they were uh, nicely paneled wood. And these were officers' quarters for the Navy, Japanese Navy officers. <clears throat> and uh, but I wasn't there very long because uh, they sent me and my platoon to a little uh, city right outside Seto, S-E-T-O, and uh, I felt good about being independent of. <laughs> and had my own platoon with me. Um, and why were you sent there? That was a good question, but they they wanted you know, to have order and uh, to to keep the uh, any uprising, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very, very unlikely. Um, We went into town and we took over the second floor of a pottery building. The town is well known for its pottery. Mm -hmm. And um, so you were sent there to try to keep an uprising from that's occurring. That's right. That's right. And uh, I first thing you do when on these missions is to get in touch with the mayor and the chief of police. So I did, and uh, um, things went very went well. They, we had a little bit of training there to keep from going completely out of hand, <laughs> but uh, the, there was rarely even a, a GI that ever came to Sato. Um, while we were there, um, I w needed some paper to wrap up some things to go to send home, and I went down to the to the uh, the newspaper office and asked for some. And they said they would uh, send it to me, and. Uh, Uh, then I w it didn't come but for a couple of days, and so I went back again. And then the editor of the newspaper wrote an article about me and said that um, um, Lieutenant Swanson is an example of democracy. He drives his own Jeep. <laughs> and I, I usually, we're not supposed to drive your own Jeep, but we were out away from the battalion so I figured I could do what I needed to do. And uh, so I made the Japanese, uh, and they said, in contrast with our uh, present police officers or something, uh, he's a contrast to them. I've forgotten. Um, okay, then uh, the mayor invited me over for dinner one night and he had his, wife and daughter come out of the kitchen, meet us, 
and then they disappeared. They didn't eat with us, of course. And then uh, at Christmas time, I figured that uh, here we are in a in a pottery town, and my men, instead of eating on tin, should eat on china. So I got plates, china plates for them, so they could enjoy their Christmas meal with china. And then the uh, subgroup, I don't know, gave each one of our soldiers a, a tiny figurine for Christmas. One of the a Japanese groups? Yes, oh, okay. that's right. Uh, the Pottery Association or something, because the Pottery Association owned the building that we were bivouacked in. But they weren't, uh, the town wouldn't have... Uh, Okay. Are we running out of time? No, it's, I have. So, Mr. Swanson, you were telling us just a minute, a few minutes ago, about the um, Japanese um, newspaper man who wrote a little editorial about you, and uh, so now that you're going to read for for us the uh, the actual editorial okay. he wrote, right? Okay, it's a headline. The MP, military police commander, who came to our office to get some wrapping paper is a good, a good lesson to the Japanese to learn democracy. Lieutenant Swanson came to our office unexpectedly on 8th last at 2 p.m. and asked for wrapping paper. Chief Editor Yamaguchi willingly agreed to send him some as a gift, though the lieutenant repeatedly asked him for the cost he eventually left. Soon afterwards, some wrapping paper was sent to the Sato police station for delivery to Lieutenant Swanson. Apparently, the paper had not reached him as he came again in the evening inquiring for same. Upon being informed that the paper had already been sent, he quietly went back immediately. To think that a commander of the MP comes twice just, just for wrapping paper can in no way compare with the Japanese army or even the present proud police chiefs. We should deeply ponder over this incident. We have learned many things after our defeat in war, such as officers of the invading army driving jeeps themselves, doing repairs, and sometimes piloting planes. But with the daily life of Lieutenant Swanson, we have learned more about democracy. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we left uh, Seto. We were only there about a month when I think it was decided that there was nothing for us to do in Seto. Um, but the mayor, uh, had a party for us all, and he had some entertainment. Uh, I've forgotten just where it was, but, uh, at any rate, this was a farewell party, and uh, there was plenty of sake. And uh, unfortunately, the mayor got embarrassingly drunk, and uh, somebody disappeared with him. So I figured it was time for us to leave too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the end of Sato for us. We then went with the rest of the 25th Division to uh, Osaka. And there we were in a commercial, a commercial school building. And uh, uh, Osaka is close to Kyoto and Nara. And uh, Kyoto is the, uh, and Nara are, I think one of them is the old capital, ancient capital of Japan. And there was very, uh, no, no bomb damage to those places. So uh, I went up there and uh, the deer in the park at Nara were still there. Um, there was danger of a typhus epidemic. So we had orders to use DDT on all of the houses and people too. So um, that 
uh, was a mission that it took, took quite a while to perform. And uh, when I got home, I had occasion to buy some DDT, and then I reflected on how much of it we had used to on this this uh, delousing um, campaign in Kyoto and Osaka. Then our so they actually required you to use it on the people. Yes, that's right. And uh, uh, this was a delicate operation with some of the women. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> um, um, let's see. Then we, <clears throat> Cannon Company, was sent to the island of Iwajishima. And Iwajishima is in the Bay Osaka Harbor. And it was a resort island where the the um, wealthy people in Osaka went for the summer months, and we occupied a, uh, a hotel there, which was not being used for anything. And the first thing we did was to lay a telephone wire down to the port, so that if any brass came over. From the mainland, we would have time to get ready for them. <laughs> uh, we enjoyed the independence, again, just like I did at Sato. We enjoyed the independence of being away from the main unit. Um, it must have been beautiful there. It was very nice. And uh, the cherry blossoms were coming and in uh, April and May. Um, we were getting some. Uh, replacements at this time, and uh, not only uh, enlisted men, but officers too. And the officers that were coming in were new uh, West Point graduates. And uh, uh, just like we did in all the towns, the first thing is make contact with the chief of police. And uh, we did, and that's uh, our orders were to 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 um, get rid of or collect all uh, weapons. <clears throat> and um, I found out that the Japanese jail, they're nothing really more than a cage. Uh, and one morning I was going over the bridge close to the hotel and I saw a uh, corpse in the bottom of the stream there so I reported that to the chief of police, and it took about two days for them to come out and investigate. Um, Why do you think that was? I think, think they just don't think that's important enough. Uh, uh, this kind uh, of cultural uh, difference between. That's right. Mm -hmm. Up in the mountains, <clears throat> I ran into a Norwegian, 82-year-old Norwegian, Oscar Samuelson, who uh, had been a customs officer. And he had a Japanese wife. And I think somehow he got stuck in Japan before the war, uh, after, uh, when the war started. But I visited with him, and they had a daughter in Oslo studying music. And uh, they wanted to write to her but they couldn't because there was a censorship. So he wrote a letter for me to send home to my parents to send to his daughter. And uh, I hope she got it. Uh, much later, I saw her, I was in Oslo and I saw his daughter and uh, she was tall like a Norwegian, but she had Japanese features. Uh, Oscar Samuelson wanted I asked him if there was anything he wanted. He said he hadn't had any cheese for a long, long time. So I went back to the company mess and got some cheese. It probably was not Norwegian cheese, but <laughs> it was good for him. He liked it. Uh, let's see, what else happened in Awajishima? 
we found quite a lot of airplane gas that was hidden in some of the caves up in the mountains. And that had to be destroyed. This was fuel that they had yeah, used right. for the airplanes? And that's right. They why were did safe. they hide it up there? I don't know, unless it was protection. They, uh, and there had been a lot of food, it seemed, that had been brought from the mainland and stored in Awajishima because perhaps they thought that Awajishima wouldn't be bombed. Uh, so I'm on my way home in April or May and again at Zama, the port city close to Yokohama, I met a high school graduate from the University of Illinois, from East Bend High School, um, Andy Bauer. He was in my class and he was waiting to go home. Uh, he had a brother that was killed in North Africa, so he had, they took that into account. So... Who, where had he been serving? He, he had been in the Philippines, okay. yeah. Uh, I have <clears throat> a cousin, Oscar Swanson, who uh, um, was a naval, was a corpsman, medical corpsman, in the Navy, and uh, he was on the USS Bliss. And just by chance, I went home on the Bliss. So we had a chance to get reacquainted. He had been to Antioch University in Ohio, and where they spend six months working and six months in school, and he had spent six months with us on the farm. So I spent on the way home on the USS Bliss, I uh, spent most of my time in sick bay because the beds were better there than <laughs> where they had us bunked. So I got to Seattle and uh, stopped. There was a big white boat that came out to meet us and welcome us to Seattle. Um, So that then, oh yes, I uh, <clears throat> at Seattle, at Fort Lawton, uh, I decided to be discharged there and then I'll find my own way home because I wanted to stop and see my aunt and uncle and cousin in Salem, Oregon. So then the question came up about whether I wanted to stay in the reserves. And uh, I thought about it, <clears throat> thought about it, and uh, I thought about here I am, I'm, I've got safely through the war, and uh, so only saw a small amount of combat, and many of my buddies didn't make it. So I thought I had uh, not yet paid my dues, <laughs> so I stayed in the reserve. And little did I know that in five years I would be called up again. But uh, that was what I decided at that time, that uh, I really hadn't paid off my debts. Sounds like you served your country pretty well, I would say. But you were given a choice at that point, whether you That's wanted right. to do that or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your rank then? When I was first lieutenant. First lieutenant. Yeah. And I made captain two or three years later because I was in the reserve. Mm -hmm. But you had a lot of um, friends that didn't make it through the war. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So? And then you, um, I would like to ask you a little bit, um, go back a little bit about uh, your time in Japan. Um, it, it must have been kind of a terrifying thing when they dropped those atom bombs. Oh, yes. Um, no one quite knew what the um, effect of that would be. Um, but of course your reaction, it understandably, is that you were so pleased with President That's Truman right. yeah. because that meant that you didn't have mm -hmm. to then invade That's the right. country and 
Um, how did you feel about the Japanese people uh, before you landed there, would you say? Um, because, of course, they had been the enemy and caused Pearl Harbor and That's right. all the terrible things in Guadalcanal and, and things that had gone on with your division before you joined them. Mm -hmm. um, well, I felt that they were our enemy, clear and simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, that maybe the the people at home in Japan weren't quite uh, quite the same as those that were fighting us, but uh, they were our enemy, and they had to be dealt with. And when you actually were there in the small town of Seto and no. on the island, it, oh, that was very different. They were they. Oh, they were. They were. It was a good relationship. That's actually. right. Yeah. And I felt it, it was genuine, you yeah. mm -hmm. I've been back to Japan. I taught summer school in 1958 in Hokkaido. And uh, uh, I found that they, they, they didn't mind talking about the war, but not too much. Mm -hmm. So it was a life-altering experience for them, obviously, and and, you oh, yes. and, and all and everyone who went through those years. Um, so you decided that you would st stay in the U.S. Army Reserves. Yes. And then um, you did get called up again, too. That's right. I got called up at the time of Korea. And uh, I was on the faculty here in Ag Economics at that time. And I had just... Uh, finished my Ph.D. in, it had quite a lot of work in uh, economics and statistics. So I was called into the uh, office of the chief of staff, G4, in the Pentagon. So I spent my two years in the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So you never had to actually go into no, that's um, right. combat that's duty right. in, in that's Korea, right. but you certainly served your country very, well, <laughs> very yeah. well in that regard. Um, so, did you feel that? Um, how did you feel that the, the your war experience influenced? Did you feel it influenced your decision and what you would just pick as a career and how you? Oh proceeded yes, I think. From uh, there? Uh, I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. Because I, even though I had a bachelor's degree when I went in, uh, I still had a lot of learning to do. And I think I matured. And I think the experience I got in teaching, because that's what uh, the replacement training center is, is all it is, is teaching. And I think that was good experience for me. Uh, so all in all, I don't know, it, it had a, a positive effect for sure, but I could have got the same effect with, through some other channel without going to the war, mm -hmm. I guess, but that's all right. But from a small town in Illinois, you did actually get a lot of experience that's right. in the big world. I, that's I right. noticed from looking at some of your papers, uh, the titles of your papers, yeah. you did uh, do some work in the Caribbean and oh, that's right. other places yeah. around the world. And you said you went and taught in Japan again yeah. then later. So it it was really part of your... That's right. Um, I had never been to Europe until 1948. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, unless you have anything to add, no, I think... No, no. Certainly appreciate very much your sharing your experience and telling your story. Um, well, you have to edit anything out? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Swanson. Well, good. It went better than I thought, I think. Yes. <laughs>